Hello, everybody. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak here. I've given a presentation on what Aquarium's been doing for the last couple of years. Um, I'm not going to get into all the details that we've done over the last couple of years. If you have spe you know, specifics on a lot of the details, you can come up and talk to me afterwards. But I'm going to try to give you a quick update and then what our results have been the last couple of years and then what we're doing this year as well. So um, this is what I kind of always start with in the presentation. This is uh, our Greenwich Reservoir. Um, what it normally looks like and then what it looked like in the fall of 2016, which is only three years ago. So we're st we are the water system that Lori mentioned that had plastic pipe going down the Merritt Parkway to bring water from Bridgeport into Greenwich. We are down to uh, 45 days of remaining supply for the city of Greenwich. So that was a, a pretty tough spot to be in and really not somewhere you want to be as a water manager operating a water system responsible for all of the businesses as well as the residents and the fire protection for that part of the state. So we did move ahead with um, some ideas of what we could do to get the demands under control. Um, fortunately, we had already started down this path because uh, there were several things that um, were coming. We have the regional pipeline, we have the uh, stream regulations and stuff that are going to reduce our safe yield. So we'd already started down this and we'd done a study the year before with Amy around water conservation, what were our options. So fortunately we had that in our hands already and we were able to open it right up and see what, what there is. But the big things, and Amy mentioned this, is the, some of the statistics are staggering. Um, our most water efficient customers are very water efficient. Uh, in Greenwich, 50% of the customers only use 18% of the water. So most of the customers actually are very efficient. But our large users are very large users. 25% of the customers are using 61% of the water. So that problem that we had with that reservoir wasn't really created by everybody. It was really created by a small portion of our population. Um, and then when you look at the outdoor water use, that's where we saw the largest potential for savings because it represented 46% of our year-round use. That's including the fact that they're not using them for six months of the year. So it's a, a substantial part of the, of the water use, uh, particularly during the summer months. So we thought we'd focus our water conservation efforts on the high and very high. We ended up talking to Dallas Water. They had implemented a system, uh, two-day-a-week restrictions five years earlier than that, had had good results. And when you looked at them, you know, their average rainfall is 36 inches a year. Ours is 48 inches a year. Their summer temperature average is 92 degrees. Ours is 82 degrees. We kind of came away with, well, if Dallas, Texas can do days, two days a week, we shouldn't, Connecticut, find a way to be able to do two days a week. So we went ahead with a two-day-a-week irrigation policy. We used the Dallas as a, the model, um, even addresses on Saturdays and Sundays and Wednesdays, and odd addresses on Saturdays and Tuesdays. Applies only to automatic sprinkler systems and hose sprinklers, like when you have a sprinkler at the end of a hose and you just leave it running. It does not apply to handheld watering, drip irrigation, soaker hoses. And we did establish a variance process, and we'll explain that a little bit later, but Dallas had had some things that they bumped into and said you're going to need to give some people some ability to work outside the system as well. Uh, so the two-day weeks went into place in 2017 in four towns, Greenwich, Stanford, New Canaan, and Darien. And then we expanded it in 2018 to Newtown and Westport. We are intending to continue to expand that year by year. We didn't expand it this year, and we'll explain that a little bit because we kind of changed our program a little bit and some of our messaging. So we'll be looking to expand it again going forward. We did a lot of communication leading into 2017, 2017 and 18. Flyers went to all the customers, had a lot of uh, advertisements in the local papers, you know, billboards at the railroad stations to get the word out as much as possible. And we've used, taken advantage of our own website quite a bit. There's a lot of information on our website. The variance process goes through our website. Um, there's a lot of uh, documentation of water saving options that people have or more information on water saving that UConn's developed, other uh, organizations have developed. And we even had developed a process, automated a process for reporting violations that you can kind of highlight address, see it from an aerial photograph, take a picture, drop it in, and we get all that information from our employees. So we did as much as we could to get as much information out to the customers and to automate the process as much as possible too. So enforcement, so what we do, just because we do think it's important to enforce, we, you know, we don't think we just want to do two days a week and just hope everybody complies. We want people to realize we are paying attention to this and, um, and, che and checking out from time to time. So we do do site visits uh, on mornings to see what, if people are complying with the schedule. And then uh, we also get customer notifications. We have a process that people can send in anonymous emails 
and let us know if they think, and then we'll follow up to see if we continue to see them wandering outside the schedule. We follow up with a letter uh, and then uh, potentially a phone call as well to the customers, and there's kind of a step process. Um, and ultimately, we, we notify the town as well as the state that if we get to like a third or fourth situation. But I would say um, 85, 90 percent of the people, once they kind of realize we're paying attention, you have a conversation with them, explain to them why we're doing this and what the benefits are, most people comply. But there are always going to be some people who aren't as willing to comply as we'd like them to be. And just some totals, uh, what we had total violations in 2017 versus 2018. 2018 was probably higher because we added a couple towns to it as well. We added Westport and Newtown. So that was a, a, a part of the reason why the violations went up. Just to go use to some of the data, you may not be able to see it, but the, the bars represent from the left our total demands for the four towns from the months of April through October from 2010 on the left to 2018 on the right. And what you can see is that 2017, the second bar from the right, is our second lowest demand for the four towns since 2010. And you can see the bar all the way to the right is our lowest demand for uh, since 2010. So you've had multiple weather conditions over that multiple year period, and we've had our two lowest demand periods in those last two years. The red line represents the total amount of rainfall in that time, so you can kind of see that that, you know, it doesn't necessarily line up exactly with the rainfall. The rainfall was down in 2017, and we were well below what we had in comparable years with similar rainfall. Um, then looking at the days of the week, you know, it's kind of the same data. This is each group of bars is Sunday uh, groups of days, uh, the days. So from the left, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then in each group of bars is a period of time. So it's 2000, the blue bar is 2010 to 2015. The red is 2016, the drought year. Yeah, the green is 2017, and the purple is 2018. And what you can see is that 2017 and 18, the demands are lower for every single day of the week. So our demands have dropped across the board every single day of the week. In addition to that, our peak days, which used to be on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, because uh, we've had a lot of interactions with the irrigation contractors, the golf, golf course owners as well. A lot of the systems when they get installed all get set to Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and that, you know, so they were Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and they have now switched from that to Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday, the watering days. So you can see that change in the behavior. So we see that as well. The other benefit from a water perspective, it has simplified the operation of our system. By taking half of the irrigation and, you know, and splitting it over four days, um, we have tanks that we don't have issues with anymore. We used to have some tanks that would get very low and be a real struggle to keep them full in the, in the early morning when the demands are up and the irrigation's going. We don't have that issue in those critical tanks anymore. Just to give you an idea of the total numbers, so if you, know, you see these are the averages of uh, mil uh, million gallons per day that we're using across those different periods from May through October. Um, the difference for 2017 was 3.8 million gallons a day from two, uh, compared to 2010 and 2000 to 2015, and 4.24 million gallons a day in 2018. That's every single day, on average, we save that amount of water. So if you look at the totals, you look across the, those months, May through October, we saved almost 700 million gallons in 2017, and we saved over almost 800 million gallons in 2018. That doesn't even take into account that we've added Westport and Newtown. That's just looking at the same four towns. Um, so substantial savings. And the Greenwich Reservoir is a little over 2 billion gallons, so it's essentially a third of a reservoir that we were able to recover by having that savings. Um, I know some people look at 2018. It was a wet year. Obviously got the savings because of all the rain. And if you look at this, this is the blue bars are the average rainfall per month. The green bars what the actual rainfall in 2018 were by month. And you can see the right side of the graph. We had substantial rainfall the second half of the year, and that's correct. But if you look at through August, um, they were pretty much either right around or very close to normal rainfalls to that point of the year. So I kind of re-looked at the data just to look through May through August. And if you look at the difference, even May through August last year in 2018, we saved five and a, almost 5.28 million gallons per day every day for that period, May through August. And if you look at that total, before the rains really came in, we still saved about 650 million gallons of demand during that period. So even before the rains really came, we had substantial savings. 
Um, so again, you know, then the rainfall came and we had the fall and it's been different. But the benefit of that is a year ago we were in this situation. This is a, one of our reservoir graphs, Greenwich Reservoir. The average is the green bar and that solid line is where we were in February of 2017 going into the year. Don't like to be that low. Um, and now in 2019, we are basically full going into the, you know, so our reservoirs have all spilled at this point, and we're in a much better situation from a water supply perspective going into 2019. Another thing that's big difference, you know, that rainfall, this is from, um, this is a three-year total rainfall to date, going back 100 years. So the line in the middle represents what the average rainfall is for a three-year period. And then for each month for the last 100 years, the green line represents how either much above that normal rainfall you were and how much below we were. In f January of 2018, you can see where we were way to the right, well below normal rainfall for the previous three years, um, down on the order of the 60s drought. That's the, the kind of drought that we were dealing with in 2016, 2017. is something on the order of the 60s drought. You look at where we are now, this is through May, on the right side, we've completely recovered and we're back above normal rainfall for the previous three years just because of the amount of rain that we've gotten in the six month, last couple of months. Looking at that, so we're trying to figure out how do we manage this now because drought isn't going to be a good message down in these four towns. They dealt with it. There's rain all the time. How receptive are they going to be to the idea of drought? And if you also look at the history of the 100 years, generally when we've had a low period like that, when you come back up, you have a couple of years where you're high again. So we're anticipating we're going to be above normal rainfall for the next couple of years, and our drought messaging probably isn't going to be very effective. So, um, so we were looking at last, you know, trying to learn from last year's program and figure out what we're going to do for the 2019 program. So for 2017, 2018, we think the two days a week was successful. We see it as successful, saved on the order of 800 million gallons per year, and it had a real positive impact on our reservoirs. Um, but on the other side of the conversation, we think the drought is over from our perspective, you know, initially at least short term. The reservoirs are full and we're, we're, we anticipate a few wet years ahead of us based on the 100 year record. But we still need demand management for several reasons. We can't just stop doing what we were doing because everything had started raining and now we can forget about it. Uh, Southwest regional county demands, they still exceed what our um, uh, margin of safety is for that part of the state. So we need to, we're extending and expanding the capabilities of the pipeline to bring more water down to that part of the state. And it's not completed yet. We're still going to need permitting. We're still going to need approval from both DEEP and DPH and Pura. And we're going to have to explain why we need to bring this much water and what have we done to minimize that water need. Um, also, we want to reduce the potential for future droughts. Um, it can happen quickly. If you see these two charts, I think one is September of 2016 and the one on the right is then October. So when within one month, the drought recognition went from just a small part of the state to the whole entire state in one month period. So we're in a situation, we're in a position where things can happen quickly and it does impact everybody. You know, that's the one thing we learned from our experience in Greenwich is, yep, it affects watering lawns, but you're affecting landscapers, you're affecting uh, nurseries, you're affecting power washers, pool builders, you're affecting car washes, you're affecting businesses across the board. That uh, really is not something we like to be in the position of doing. Uh, and the stream flow regulations. Uh, Denise had talked about them earlier. They are in, on, you know, they're in, the clock has started ticking and we're going to lose 15% of our safe yield going forward as a result of this. It's a, you know, we were part of the conversation, but we also have to recognize there is that impact and we're going to have to address, make up for that shortfall um, going forward. So what we decided to do this year is we're going ahead with some new messaging. We've been working with the irrigation contractors, getting feedback on this. And uh, what we're trying to do is we're not mentioning drought. We're not putting the big red bar through irrigation, you know, the, the heads anymore. We're saying, hey, it's, it's, it's time for responsible watering. And it starts here and giving, trying to educate our own customers on what they should be looking for, what they should be asking their contractors, their irrigation contractors for. So we give them an idea of what a good head looks or a better, a more efficient head looks like versus a less efficient head. We're trying to be more positive, not as punitive. Um, let's stay sustainable. And we intend to continue educating the customers about better designs, better controllers, working with licensed experts, 
And then also around system safety, you know, getting, you know, starting to deal with backflow prevention and make sure people realize that they should have a backflow preventer on their system. So let me uh, just do a quick refresher before I kind of finish up here. Um, so what we have, it's two days a week, like I said, Sundays and Wednesdays, Saturdays and Tuesdays. It applies to the irrigation con uh, uh, buried systems and the systems that have a sprinkler at the end of a hose. And it doesn't apply to the handheld watering. And we have a variance process. The variances, um, we have a new planting variance. So when someone puts in new sod or new uh, shrubs or new trees, um, they can come to our website, apply for an exemption, and they're exempt from the schedule for five weeks. They even get a placard that they can put up on their window so that their neighbors know that they've, they're going through that process and they're working with us and we're aware of it. Um, it's not applicable in July and August. We shut down that, that system in July and August because we don't want to really encourage people to try to establish new landscaping in July and August. And we, like I said, the permits to be posted on site. We also have a large property variance. So if you have over three acres, well, it's three acres, we've reduced it down to two, and it's going to be hard for you to water on a two-day-week schedule. You can come in and ask for a variance to water outside the schedule, but it requires you committing to a 15% reduction of what you were using in 2015, and it also requires an inspection. We have a, been working with uh, Ted Moriarty uh, with the Irrigation Association to do inspections and make sure that there aren't things out there that need to be addressed if the system's got you know, significant problems or design issues that we want to have addressed before we give them that exemption. And then we've added a high efficiency in, um, in 2018, and all of these you can apply through the website. Um, the new planting variants, again, like I said, is for new established new grass. It's for five weeks. You can see the numbers that we've had in previous years. One thing we have bumped into is new construction. A lot of people sell their houses or a builder builds a house, needs to sell it in July or August. That's on the closing date, but they have to establish lawn. And we've been working around that. If the town has a building permit on record, they've been, they're aware of it, then we allow that to go through as well. <clears throat> and they can, uh, they can do an extension request because sometimes the stuff doesn't get in according to exactly on schedule. So they can you know, essentially automate, get an automated two-week extension if they need to in order to keep watering the grass. Uh, large properties, you know, just the idea of on the numbers that we we're dealing with. And it's really, again, like I said, to, be, uh, to address uh, properties that have been, can't be watered in one day. Again, it's inspected by an irrigation expert and um, a commitment to reduce the water use by 15% over what they've been using in 2015. And then if the system isn't up to date um, to you know, get the, you know, the, if it's not the current standards, to correct things that are identified as not being up to current standards. The high efficiency, this is what we implemented last year. And this is working with the irrigation contractors, trying to figure out a way to make it positive if someone, you know, maybe encourage people to go down this path. <laughs> Um, what it requires is it's similar to what there was in the last presentation. The smart controllers have a lot of capabilities. It's got to be an EPA water sense labeled smart controller. It's got to be installed in accord. The system's got to be uh, installed in accordance with, with the best uh, management practices of the Irrigation Association. And again, it's, they have to be working with a licensed irrigation contractor, and they've got to commit to a 20% reduction over what they were using in 2015. Um, enforcement, some people why, ask why we, we feel so strongly about enforcement, but there is a credibility aspect to the, uh, uh, we feel a sense of, that we'll lose credibility over time if we're not enforcing it and people don't feel that there's any follow-up or checking on, this, on who's irrigating or not irrigating. And so we do, you know, and I'll tell you, a picture is worth a thousand words when our guys go out in the morning. If they can snap a picture with the person's mailbox, we get an email later or a phone call later in the day saying, oh, I wasn't watering, there's no way I was watering. And you send them a photograph that shows them their mailbox with the driveway all wet, it solves, it stops a lot of conversations. The other thing we do get is, you know, I know there are a lot of people out here who feel very strongly about being able to water, um, you know, and it, it's, 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 it's their, you know, they're right to water their lawn as much as they want, but there are a lot of people who don't feel that way as well. So we get some nasty, we get some nasty emails from some of our customers wondering why this is allowed, why this is tolerated. And you, when you do look at those numbers I showed earlier, it's really, it's really 25% of our customers that are really, really stressing the system more than everybody else and creating an impact on everybody else. So we're just trying to find a way to you know, modulate some of that behavior to make it better for everybody in the long run. 
Um, one thing that we are bumping into this year is now that we're a couple of years away from the drought, I think a lot of people may not have chosen to put irrigation systems in in 2016, 2017 because of the drought, the fallout from it, but I think we're seeing an uptick in that. And so a lot of irrigation systems are going in the last year or so. We don't have the history of, you know, to compare their water use to 2015. So again, working with, the irrig you know, with uh, Ted Moriarty, um, our, you know, the irrigation um, uh, trainer, he identified that water smart uh, EPA has a tool that you can go in and do some calculations to figure out what qualifies as a water, uh, efficient use of water on a, a piece of property. So you can put in, you know, characteristics about the property and get a calculation that says, okay, this is the amount of water that they should be using in a, in a good, bad, or medium type system. And we're using that at least as a guide to give the irrigation contractors some, some guide for where we need to work. So in 2019, you know, just kind of going forward, like I said, summarizing, uh, we're going ahead with a new message. It's positive. We're trying to be more positive, not quite as punitive. Um, let's stay sustainable, and we're trying to educate the customers more. We want to really reduce the potential for future droughts. Like it's, we, I showed, uh, we saw in 2016, it can happen quickly, and it does affect everybody in our distribution system. The, we have, again, we still have to move forward on our regional pipeline permitting and construction, and we're going to have to be, we're going to be challenged to answer these questions of what we've done to reduce the water use, to reduce the need to bring that much water down to this part of the state, and ultimately our customers having to pay for it as well. And again, the stream flow regulations. Uh, they are, the clock, as Denise said, the clock is ticking, and we're going to lose about 15% of our safe yield in the future, which is just going to be an added strain on these types of systems, and we have to properly plan for that and address those demands going forward. And as I like to say to the irrigation contractors, because we have uh, kind of regular meetings with the irrigation contractors, if it's a wet year, like I think it's going to be for the next couple of years, it should be relatively easy to comply with. Um, we realize, you know, the, well, we're seeing the savings. What you see is, and I think, you know, uh, was talked about in a previous presentation, May, June is where it's just huge savings. People turn on irrigation systems three days a week in April, and it runs every day. If you can, you know, anything you do, cut that back. Okay, if they have to turn it on a third day at the end of July because they're afraid to lose their lawn, turn it on for one day. But you're, if you have not had all that, that use for two months, three months, just because of that demand on the hottest week of the year in the end of July or the first week of August. So that's, uh, that's the end of my presentation. That's where we are. And uh, again, just uh, what we've been doing with our customers and the latest update of information that we're sending out to them. Well, thank you. Thank you.